pod limit. Um, uh, if you screw up once we get started, we, we can't stop the clock. Uh, and so we'll get going in five, four, three, two, one. Right. All right. I'm Raj Baines. I head products at Clusterx, and I'll be talking about NoSQL, which is not only SQL, using write tool for the job. The agenda is very simple. First, I'll tell you that SQL scales, just in case you've been, you know, living under a rock. Um, and you won't actually won't know it from the previous talks. And the second thing is about uh, some rules of thumb on how to pick the right tool for the job. <coughs> so first, SQL scales. So for example, Clusterx has a client that has a 336 core deployment. It's a, it looks like a single SQL database to the application, does transactions, real-time analytics, everything. They don't do any ETL. And um, they've been running on Clusterx for over two and a half years. Um, so if we go down, their business goes down. So they rely on us. They write terabyte a day. They've got 100 million users, actually 15 to 20 million active. So SQL scales. If anybody tells you else, something else, you know, they're lying. <laughs> okay, so the second thing is rules of thumb. So the question is, which tool are you going to pick? So first is, what data do you want to store, and then what questions do you want to ask, right? So the world is kind of relational for the most part. You have customers in e-commerce who place orders for products. Customers then write reviews for products. When you pull up products, you want to look at the reviews and the customers who wrote them. That's a natural join. So a lot of your data is naturally relational, and in things like orders, all the orders are going to look pretty much the same. So relational makes a lot of sense. On the other hand, in some cases, the product catalog can have products which are very different. You might have flowers and you might have a car, and they might not share that many characteristics. So use Mongo. It works really well. Or another document store, right? So that's the right mix. Pretty much nobody uses Mongo for the other part, and it might not make sense to use relational for that part. Second, how simply do you want your questions answered? This is off the web. That's a MySQL query, and there's a Mongo query. As you can see, the MySQL query is much simpler. It does the same thing, sends code to the data, does massively parallel processing, and you do not have to jump through hoops. So, you know, if you can use SQL for your case, for, your, uh, for whatever you're trying to solve, use it. You don't have to do that. Third, when do you want your questions answered? So if you're doing reads and writes, near real time and simple reads and writes, any database will work for you. That's not a big problem. If you want to do next day analytics, you can ETL into Hadoop, use that. That's not a problem either. If you want to do real time analytics, then it gets more interesting. But that's where uh, the big data is moving to. If you have a SQL database, it can do real time analytics as well because SQL has that. For no SQL will say they do aggregates or top tens, but you know. And then you can use streaming analytics or something like that. You'd have to put a solution like that. Moving on depends on what size and flexibility do you want. So if you've got tens of terabytes of data, SQL will work just fine. You want petabyte analytics, use Hadoop. Then it's the question of flexibility. As you get more flexibility, you lose your ability to query. For example, if you're using SQL, you have a relational schema, but you can make changes to it online, right? You get joints, complex analytics. Based on statistics, as you add data, the query planner will choose a different plan for you. You can get more flexibility, and in some cases that is good, but remember what you're losing. You can't do any of that stuff. You can only do simple or index lookups. Then is the question of what guarantees do you need? So we were kind of in the space where we said, all right, use transactions for everything. You didn't need them for everything. Then we moved to like, all right, NoSQL is great. Use NoSQL for everything, and then you go like, Tch -tch. You know, and then we are like, ah, you know, transactions are kind of good for some stuff. So use what you need. If you need transactions, use transactions. If you don't need them, don't. But you know, don't use NoSQL where you need transactions. Then is geographic requirements, right? If you are setting up a multi-master, you might need um, uh, to give up asset properties. And if anybody tells you otherwise, it's not right. So you know, then you can decide what's the right solution, running short of time. So summary, SQL and SQL, uh, SQL and NoSQL both work. Art is in getting the combination right. Okay, so a single SQL database will do reads, writes, inserts, analytics, scale to tens of terabytes, and please don't do sharding. It's a waste of human effort, and it will be poorer than using a database. On the other hand, you'll use NoSQL help for caching. If you need 
uh, higher flexibility or if you need petabytes for analytics. Great. Okay. Ooh, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> you know, as, as host of the drinks, I would have given you probably an extra five seconds, but that was, that was pretty good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, the folks downstairs will un, un, uh, uh, I will take the clipper, please. Thank you. Okay. Are you good to go, or? Don't, okay. Don't touch anything, okay? <laughs> Okay, my name is Jan Vaasman, um, CEO of France Inc. And we have a database called Allegro Graph, the idea triple store. And we get a lot of customers that say, well, you're called a graph database, but you're not really a graph database because you don't do property graphs. So it's, it's something that I want to put an end to, so I made this very tiny little presentation. So we're doing a project for a big bank that saves the bank about $30 million a year in fraud detection, where we look at all kinds of interesting patterns that might indicate some kind of collusion or other fraud. One query could be, okay, find a circle of payments, say within, some, within 10 miles of San Jose, uh, within the last day with the payments of more than $1,000. Yeah, so you mix geospatial, temporal, and all these other things. Now, normally, if you would do this, you would do it in a graph database, and you would have nodes, links between nodes. Now, what makes a property graph is that the, the links between nodes also have properties. Yeah? So here you see that this person pays the, oops, this person pays this person, but this pays relationship has some properties, this will have other ones, etc., etc. Now, in most great graph databases, this won't really scale because it's an aggregate query. Yeah? The graph databases work fantastic if you start with one node and you do a pair now. So if you want to do a big aggregate query, then you're better off with something that like, works like a relational database, uh, or at least the principles of relational databases. And then most graph databases don't do much geospatial and temporal. So what we did is, we in our graph database, we implemented um, the property graphs and hypergraphs, and then those property graphs we can uh, do with geospatial and temporal indexing, and then our query engine can deal both with the graph search and with the property graph. And for anyone that knows about RDF, who knows about RDF in this audience, that's cool. So this is the way where you do it, where you use the fourth element of the triple to create a handle where you then hang everything, everything off. And actually, in our approach, you can even have property, property, property graphs because you can keep going. All right. So then once you have this, I can do queries in the W3C language for uh, RDF graph databases called Sparkle. And here's a query where we try to find the ring of payments where the first part of the query We'll try to find the circle. And when we find the circle, we also find the handles for the, the payments. And then we can look at the property graph for each of these links. And then we can say, well, it has to be today and it has to be 10 miles of uh, San Jose. Yes, I can demo this. And I'll just show you how it looks like. There's still two minutes left. Two minutes and three seconds. Three seconds. One second. Oh, gosh, where's my link? Here it is. Wow. So we have this database to put together. And then we created this query language where we actually can do graph search without writing any code. So basically, I can take, I can make variables, I can make links between variables. And then, so here I'll try to find a ring between A and B and C and D and E and then back to A. And then just for fun, I want to have the, the property graph for this particular link. And so I get this here. And then I just can say, Turn this into a Sparkle or Prolog query. In this case, I choose Sparkle. And I do the query. You see <coughs> this visual graph is turned into a Sparkle query. Here you get the results. And then I can visually inspect the graph to see what's actually going on. Does it make sense? All right. So going back to my presentation. So this morning, I actually talked about um, how we used Hadoop to extract data from this bank to put it into a Lego graph and do an analysis. We're now working with Intel 2 to make it easier to get these graphs out of Hadoop. And tomorrow we'll talk more about my uh, geospatial indexing, and especially when you have moving objects in your database. How can you find these objects as soon as possible or as fast as you want? Okay, thank you very much.
Okay, uh, Don Davis, if you could, um, you want to talk from down here? Or? Yeah, I'll talk from Okay, uh, you'll need to get quicker. Uh, so, Scientel is an immunosequel company. Yeah. I think they're doing your product uh, at the show this week. We are? Yeah. Take it away, Donald. Hello, everybody. By the way, you guys have really good slides. Definitely a good slide. Uh, my name is Don Zavis. I'm part of the sales team for Science L uh, in Bingham Park, Michigan. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity today. I just wanted to give you a quick nickel tour, a little bit about our company at 10.15 tomorrow. Uh, we're also doing a, uh, uh, a talk. We'll give you a little bit more detail about it. But we've been trying, we're trying to figure out what to do, how to do it, you know, how do you put together something viable in well, now less than four minutes and 30 seconds. And we decided to take the uh, David Letterman School of Thought, do a top 10 list of the things that we thought you actually positively needed to know about us in order to have it make sense for you to join us tomorrow morning at 10.15. So first and foremost, uh, Scientel is an international company. So if you have international opportunities, we can certainly help you with that. Uh, we've been in the IT systems installation business really before there was an IT business in 1997. We were actually in the NoSQL versions installed since 1985. The latest version that we have operating right now has been on the marketplace since 2003. We've made various generations and improvements at that point in time as well. Handles all types of unstructured data. So if you're in a scenario that you've got oh, videos, movies, photos, graphs, anything like that, it will easily accept and accommodate any needs that you may have. We're also transaction compliant for all structured data. So if you ever had a scenario where you might need to get two contractors, need to get two different products in there to try to work uh, uh, side by side, we've taken care of that. We don't have that issue. We can use structured data and non-structured data together. Trillions of real-time transactions for billions of customers. I think that's not just cool right there. Multiple table structures for data modeling. So we have opportunities to be able to accommodate various needs. And we've written a very friendly SQL language. So those that are looking for something that's easy to use, easy to write, easy to make modest changes on, it's very easy to do with us. Extremely high speed of operation in our Gensonics. And for those that have an opportunity, we encourage you to join us at our booth uh, tomorrow. We do a demo of this. So I know these are some pretty big posts, but I think you'll be very impressed. We have massively scalable architecture with petabytes of storage. So if you have very, very large user needs, we can accommodate that. And tomorrow I'm doing my presentations at 10.50. So we would love for you to join us. We'd be happy to go into great detail. We wanted to give you just a quick nickel tour and even leave a couple of minutes on the clock. Oh, so, by, by the way, I should also mention, for those that are inclined, we'll be down at the bar probably about 6 feet 15 today. We'd love to have you join us. There you go. I couldn't, I couldn't yeah. think of any more lightning than that. Okay. So, <laughs> go. So fast, you finished two minutes early. That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, yes. Oh, what did I say? You said that you said to ninety-seven. Ah. Seventy-seven. We, we've aged this twenty years in the last few seconds. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, and that speaker for anybody who's maybe click it. You want to walk? Yeah. Walk around to? Okay, so um, <coughs> pleasure to introduce you to Karen Lopez, uh, I mentioned earlier, <laughs> aka Data Chick. If you're a Twitter follower you, and in the data space, you cannot possibly have helped but, but uh, come across Karen's tweets. So, um, I, should I spoil the surprise? This is this is called Stuff Your Database Says About Me. <laughs> Karen Lopez, take it away. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Is it on? Hi, everybody. I'm Karen Lopez. I'm Data Chick, and I'm here to tell you about all my data in your systems. And just because you're schemaless or no SQL, there is absolutely no reason why you have to not think about data quality and data requirements, both data as it persists and as it comes out of your systems. So there's four questions I can't answer about me and your systems is, what is your phone number, where do you live, what's your date of birth, and what's your name? Can you believe that? This is my favorite rant that I talk about, especially in lightning talks, but even in longer things. So here's the first one. What is your home phone number? What is your work phone number? Guess what, people? Home numbers and work numbers no longer exist. How many people have both of those as two separate landlines now? Yes, exactly <laughs> what I thought. 
But yet our systems still persist on doing that. We put them on forms, we put them on screens, we store them in the database that way, and they don't exist. Then we have that other problem. See that 416? That's, by the way, that's my real phone number. Feel free to call me. I will never answer the phone. But <laughs> that's a foreign area code. It belongs in Canada. And if your system screens for non-US phone numbers, you're not getting my phone number. You're getting the White House, the DEA, the NSA. Well, they already have it. <laughs> so the other problem we have is where do you live? I have no idea. I live in Canada. That's another country, by the way. And I guarantee you there's a system someplace in your enterprise that won't print the country name on an envelope or a mailing or on a form. See that care of Canada? That's courtesy of U.S. State Department who has no idea that Canada's another company, country. They have to stick a sticker on it. Then we have the Association of Information Technology Professionals that has to put a sticker on it and hand write it to mail to me. Then we have my voter registration, which thinks I'm upside down in Delaware County. And so when you ask for a, my zip code and postal code that don't take numbers, I'm telling you, I'm getting the zip code for Hell, Michigan, that's 48169, because that's where you're going when you won't take letters. What is your date of birth? Yes, that's me and my twin brother down there. I was going to be an astronaut then, even. We have the same birthday. Twins, get it? Got, my first, uh, got one of my driver's licenses, date of birth on it was wrong. So I went back to the DMV and I said, you have to change my birth date, it's wrong. But you know what? You can't change your birth date in their system because whose birthdays change? Nobody's, right? <laughs> so to drive my twin brother, who's also a local sheriff, down to the DMV, make him show his driver's license so they would change it to match mine. But what they really wanted me to do is go to court and prove that I was born on another day. But here's the worst one of mine, what's your name? When I first got my first US passport, they took all those funny Hispanic middle names that I had and insisted they had to be in alphabetical order. <laughs> so that meant that now I had all these IDs with different middle names. It didn't matter, it's your passport, you're 20 years old. Who the heck cares what they put on your passport? Guess what, fast forward just a few years later, and now it has to match everything on my boarding passes. But look at these boarding passes. This week I'm Karina, that's my spy name by the way, but sometimes I'm Karen M, Karen MMS, Karen M, Lopez K, I'm Karina in other places. Sometimes people ship things to me at Data Chick. I think that drives Postal Service crazy. I have one of those fancy characters in my name that your computer system won't take, so people just randomly put accents over the letters. And then we also have these systems where, heaven forbid, my husband and I have different last names, but in the city of Toronto, to register my property, we had to have the same last name. So now when he kicks off and I go to get my house, I'm gonna to have to change my name. And then we have the Starbucks problem. Everyone has a Starbucks name, right? If you don't, you're missing out. My Starbucks name is Kitty, with two T's. And yet we get Kitte, Kenny, Kitty, Kitty, Kitty. This is the ultimate unstructured data, right? This is verbal data. And then we have the classic UPS. You know what this is? This is my last name. This is low, ampersand, SK, with a tilde, M, M, superimposed three, and head. Your data might be in your database, right? But it isn't coming out that way. You know that, right? So here's what you must do to love your data. I want you to fight myths about names. There's a great blog post out there that lists like 100 different myths about people's names. You should go find it. You need to expand your world, and so do all your developers and people writing your reports. You need to support the full life cycle data. That's delete, update, and insert. I don't care what your database does, but in the real world, data has to be deleted, updated, and inserted. And you need to memorize this and tell your developers, if you want your database to simple, go out and make the world simple, and then come back to me, and I will make it all simple. So, whoops. So don't ask me what my name is, what my address is, what country I live in, what my phone number is. I don't know until you tell me. So you're, keep calm, love your data, your data needs more cowbell. There's the phone. So I mentioned that uh, Daniel sort of twisted our arm here. He, uh, he originally proposed, I think, three different talks, or, or wanted a 15-minute lightning talk, and we said, well, no, you can't do that. <laughs> so he twisted our arm into two five-minute ones, and then finally got us to put them both together. So he's essentially got a 10-minute talk, but we're going to cut him off halfway through. Uh, <laughs> right, thanks for that. Daniel, um, take it away. You want to speak down here? Or up? Uh, I'll stand up there. Yep. The, um, right. So anyway. Good evening, everyone. I'm Daniel Austin. I'm Chief Architect at PayPal. Everybody got a PayPal account, right? Very good. All right, so this is a really fast talk, a little bit about me. In the past, I was a physicist. I worked at a place called CERN. The LHC lives there now. I ran into this guy named Tim Berners-Lee. It's all been downhill ever since. <laughs> the, um, 
I'm going to talk today about one uh, subject that mixes two of my favorite topics, physics and computing. So we're going to talk a little bit about quantum computing. You're not going to understand a word of this. It's okay. <laughs> Uh, next year, if I do these talks, Bianca's offered to cater us some Red Bull, it'll be useful. <laughs> when people ask me about quantum computing, they ask, why do we need quantum computers? What's the difference between your analog computer, the computer you're carrying around in your wallet, your desktop? It's fundamentally, qualitatively a different animal. We use quantum logic to describe quantum computing. It's very different. The answers are not just yes and no. They could be yes, no, or maybe. And we don't always get yes or no results. We get probabilistic results. There's a 60% chance that, you know, it's going to rain tomorrow. Well, maybe not in San Jose. But uh, we get probabilistic results. There's also a lot of quantum mechanical effects in here. We get teleportation. We're going to talk about that in about 45 seconds. Um, some super dense coding, non-causal computations. That means that the cause and the effect aren't necessarily related. Uh, multiversal parallelism, alternate universes, and all that. A lot of craziness goes on in quantum computing. Quantum computing is based on circuits, which are made up of gates. These represent mathematical operators that op operate on some hairy function that nobody can solve. So we use little pictures in order to illustrate these things, because if you actually tried to do those integrals, well, it wouldn't end well. The gates, that, the gates that we use are, are very similar to the ones that you studied in school. Anybody who took an EE class, took a, a class in electrical engineering will recognize this concept. Basically, these are gates. A signal goes through them. They're changed by the gate, and then we get a result. These are a couple examples of the sort of gates that we use in quantum uh, computing. This is an operator. This is actually what we call a Hadamard gate. It's a good friend, that H there. We'll see it on a couple more slides. Basically, these are logic gates that we use for quantum computing. I wanted to show you what a standard quantum circuit might look like. This is actually what an algorithm might actually look like. Oh, and if you think I talk really fast, I learned that from Tim. The, uh, no, seriously, anybody who's heard Tim Berners-Lee talk knows that he talks a mile a minute, and that's where I learned it. Um, seriously, this is a, uh, what we call the Deutsch algorithm. All of this stuff here with the fanciness, what it does is it turns a 1 into a 0 or vice versa. Nothing more complicated than that. So you can imagine that if you're going to go and build, you know, Google or Facebook, it's going to take you quite a few of these. We can't do any of that just yet, but it won't be very long. One of the craziest things people ask me about in the quantum world is quantum teleportation. I mean, this can't happen outside of the movies, right? Area 51's over here, you're over here, can't go back and forth. It doesn't really work that way in the quantum world. We can teleport information, not substances, not objects, but real information from A to B without crossing the space in between. The, uh, the current record for this is about 143 kilometers. They did this in the Tenerife Island, or the Canary Islands, uh, from the island of Tenerife to another island, and we're able to teleport some information across that gap without passing through the space in between. The, uh, how that happens is a little complicated, but the schematic of the device is here. It involves a beam splitter and some mirrors. Alice and Bob are gonna exchange some qubits Qubits are the quantum equivalent of bits, basically yes, no, and maybe, not just yes and no. The diagram's a little complicated. I don't want to get into that too much. Here, once again, is the quantum circuit description of that. Um, what's our current state in quantum computation? I mean, this all sounds like science fiction. It's great, but it's maybe the wrong convention. Maybe I should have gone to the science fiction convention. No, it's all real. It's here. Google is actually going to run one. I'm not kidding. The, uh, so, what's our, our current state of play? We can read and write 512 qubits, the D-Wave uh, uh, quantum computing, I think it's the D-Wave 2 model, now has a 512 qubit chip, you can buy it. Thank you. So, turning on that. That slide. means time is up. Um, so this is the last slide on this one, we're carrying it. Uh, okay, well, okay. We, we have to go to the next one. That's this. fine. Yep. No? Okay, that's fine. Yep. No, uh, that's, yeah. The next slides go right in. It's fine. The, um, yeah. Right. Okay, so this there is, is really just part two. There is a, uh, yeah. So if, if there is a segue from one to the other, I'll, I'll, I'll allow that in extra time.
I'm headed. So, okay, so uh, that, that kind of, there was a little segue there, but. Uh, okay. <laughs> you, want, you want to mention it now? No, it's fine, go ahead. Okay, all right. <laughs> all right, so basically the current state for quantum computation is we can do 512 qubits, we can move quantum co teleportation to about 143 kilometers. And we launched and put into production the first quantum computer in the world today. Lockheed did, NASA, and, and uh, Google just purchased a second one at D-Wave 2. It'll be put into production later this year. The second part of the talk is really about Grover's search, which is a good example of a quantum algorithm. In fact, it's the fastest possible search of a database. And since it's no SQL conference, I thought this might be a good topic. Grover's search is actually provably optimal for searching a random database, which is kind of remarkable. Um, just to give you an idea of the complexity difference here, we can run Grover in n to the one half time, whereas normally we run it in o to the n or worse. Actually, most systems in the real world do worse. The, uh, the gates, once again, I'm gonna skip these because I showed them to you earlier and skip to the meat. This is what Grover's search algorithm looks like. This is the fastest possible search algorithm in this universe. And just to give you an idea of what's happening here, we're applying some operators to some inputs. There's some ones and zeros over there. Those are qubits. They come in here. They go through a Hadamard transform. Then we, in, we do some work on them, and then we invert all the things that we did, and then we take a measurement of that. And that's what this little object here at the end is, is a measurement gate. We finally actually got a result. Of course, it was a probabilistic result. If you wanted to write code for this, there's been multiple languages out there. I use QCL for most things. This is an example of QCL for Grover's uh, algorithm. You can kind of see, once again, what we do here. We use the H gate, that Hadamard transform. We do an inversion. We check the phase of the, uh, the bit that we're looking at. Then we undo the inversion, undo the Hadamard transform, and lo and behold, the resulting bit has the answer that we want. The... Um, it's actually true, that's exactly how it works. The, um, so once again, just uh, to, people ask me, you know, so prove it, it's the fastest search, prove it. Well, one slide isn't gonna contain that. This guy's gonna be all over me if I try to prove it in, that, in this shorter period of time. But just to give you a flavor of the search, any, or of the proof, any alternate algorithm will have to compute just as many iterations as Grover's does, and we can prove that, and therefore, they're equivalent. The uh, one thing about the Grover search is it does require an oracle, which is a black box. The, uh, the black box really doesn't have any function. It doesn't change the quantum nature of the algorithm, but it is a required part of this, and people ask me about that. Um, computer scientists talk about quantum computing as if it was some branch of, of computation or something. They're not physicists, right? So they're worried about complexity theory, and one of the big questions around Grover search is does it prove that NP the number of normal problems, so to speak, is contained in the bounded quantum uh, probabilistic problem set. And the answer, in my view, no. NP is not contained in BQP, Nobel Prize forthcoming next year. <laughs> the number of op op iterations is optimal based on a constant around the square root of the number of entries. If for K entries, I'm gonna have to do this many iterations over the data set to prove it. Once again, the slide is too small, as for Matt said, contain this proof. <laughs> Just summing it up, Grover search is the fastest possible search algorithm, runs in this uh, number of iterations for K entries. Quantum computing algorithms are based on gates and circuits defining operators that change the state of qubits. These algorithms are qualitatively different. This is not your grandfather's computing. It's fundamentally different. If you can teleport something from one machine to another, that ought to give you the idea of just how crazy it is. I mean, goodbye network, right? There's a lot of progress in this field right now. We're starting to see the first commercial implementations. A uh, new quantum language, Kipper, was released earlier this year. It's actually uh, really useful. It's built on Haskell. I don't know if anybody's played with it. And I thought I would leave you with a small bit of advice around quantum computing. Still have 25 seconds. <laughs> you still have 25 seconds, 20 seconds. Ah, okay, for my last 20 seconds, I'm speaking tomorrow, or probably I'm speaking on Thursday afternoon at one o'clock. Even bigger topic, reconceiving the World Wide Web as a distributed NoSQL database. Woohoo! great. Okay, I'm gonna redistribute it.
Are you allowed to say that? It was, it was a phenomenal talk. I mean, can you, can you imagine trying to distill quantum computing in five minutes? It was phenomenal. Yeah. But... Ten. Ten. Okay, okay. But, man, it was, it was literally breathtaking. Yeah. So, um, so okay. So I'm here to talk to you about Foundation DB, which is the name of the company that, that I work at. I'm one of the co-founders and the name of the product that we're building. Um, and today we're making an announcement about Foundation DB. So the story up till now, if you haven't been following it, is that when Foundation DB, uh, when we founded the company four years ago, we were sort of confronted with this compromise, this challenge, when we were looking at database systems, which is do we adopt a NoSQL database and get all of the operational advantages, the distributed design, the fault tolerance, all of that stuff? Or do we go with a database that has acid transactions and transactional integrity? And to us, these seemed like two things that we, we wanted both of them. And so we founded FoundationDB to build a product that combined those properties. Um, we did two and a half years of development in stealth, and then went to another year and a half in alpha and beta testing. And that brings us to today, um, almost over four years later, uh, which we're announcing commercial availability of the Foundation DB product today. Ooh. So very excited for our team. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, what we're bringing to market is the first commercial distributed NoSQL database with true high performance acid transactions. So NoSQL and transactions. And we're also bringing to market the first NoSQL database to offer true data model flexibility. And this is really enabled by the transactional guarantees that are within FoundationDB. Those transactions allow you to build strong abstractions that let you build other data models on top of FoundationDB's basic key value API. We're also announcing today the business model for FoundationDB and the licensing for FoundationDB. And our number one goal is we all sort of know the database market has a reputation of being difficult to work with. So our goal is to be the easiest database company in the world to work with. So to that end, the easiest thing in the world is free. So what we're announcing is an incredible free community license for FoundationDB, which is unlimited in size of data, unlimited in number of operations per second, unlimited in a lot of ways, limited to six FoundationDB worker processes. Also unlimited in that you can use it in production. So what we're announcing is a, is a community license, which doesn't just get you started with FoundationDB, it actually lets you run it in production in a meaningful fault-tolerant configuration. We're also announcing flexible and transparent pricing for the product. The pricing is $99 per worker process per month. So that's the transparency. The flexibility comes from this per process licensing model. By licensing it not per machine or differentiating based on hardware specs or a lot of other um, pricing techniques and just pricing it at this simple sort of flat rate per process, it gives the user of FoundationDB a ton of flexibility to actually deploy the product whether it's in within their own data center or on the cloud or something else, in sort of the way that makes the most sense economically for them. And finally, um, FoundationDB is building an ecosystem of what we call layers, which I know is a generic term, so come talk to us afterwards and we'll talk more about that. But these layers expose a variety of data models, of libraries, and of integration with other frameworks on top of the FoundationDB database engine. One of the layers that we're especially excited about is we recently acquired another database company based out of Boston called the Akeban Technologies, who's been working on a SQL database. And by using the Akeban Technology and the way that they've built that abstraction, 
we're going to be able to deliver a SQL layer within the next couple of months to our beta customers that will run SQL, true transactional acid SQL on top of this no SQL storage engine. The ecosystem also creates a ton of partner opportunities. So if you're interested, please connect with us. We have seven members of our team here today. Um, I'm giving a panel and a presentation tomorrow on NoSQL and ACID. And we also have a very cool demo at our booth. Thank you. Ooh, great. Nice to John David. So uh, in the same spirit of thought leadership that Daniel brought us a moment ago, Mike Miller, you guys must have known each other, I guess, did you? Were you at CERN at the same time? I don't believe so. No? We're fellow physicists. Exactly. So by that rule, right, two seven. So 30% of this room is uh, recovering physicists. <laughs> I think that's true. You can write it down. All right. All right. Mike Miller of Cloud. And I'm the last thing between you and a drink, so I'll try to keep it quick. Uh, and give us a second here. So, yeah. All right. So it's a lightning talk. I'll try to be fun with this um, in, in the spirit of data chick and tell you why database as a service is not a thing that you're just going to consider as weird, but a decade from now, it's our last hope. So what do I mean by that? I promise a quantitative argument. So I'm going to start with a little bit of, of philosophy, my first postulate, I guess, of humans. We don't get exponential growth, right? It's the reason that we continue to fill up our planet. It's the reason that we continue to uh, grow actively into limited resources. That folded with reality is going to get us to this conclusion, which is that in a decade, you are not going to dream of installing your own database. Okay, this is my takeaway, and now I'm going to try to convince you of it. So my apologies to the DBAs in the room, but I think that, you know, <laughs> my goal is to extinguish your field, right? That's where we're headed. <laughs> I'm just going to be upfront and blunt about that, because it's going to allow you to do other things, right? You want to be the Instagrams of the world. So how do we get there? We're going to start with the Large Hadron Collider, and when I honestly learned what it means to be ex exponential, this is a picture of uh, one of my colleagues on the floor. It's a five-story device at CERN, oh 100 meters underground. God. This thing makes data at about an exabyte a second, and I can get to that calculation for the physicist in the room later on. But the interesting thing is that you can't dream of recording that. Right? You cannot dream of recording all that digitized data. This is the thing that, that actually samples that, but there's a collider you know, buried under the mountains that creates you know, something like um, you know, every 10 nanoseconds, there's a collision that lights up this, this entire device. And that collider itself, you can think of it like a big flashlight. Okay, it's got beams of particles. And they get brighter and brighter year over year. And the net result is about every two years, through various, uh, various kind of uh, knobs you can turn and tune, this thing doubles in the amount of data that it could potentially produce. And it took me a while to understand what that meant. It meant that every two years, I would record enough data that represented the entire amount of particle physics data with a squint to the physics <coughs> in the room. That means that everything we had ever discovered in physics could be replicated in two years. Right? So as a grad student, it's like, oh, I can just redo everything. Right, with that data. It took me a while to understand what that really meant, and that's playing out right now. So this is, you know, I, I cited something to try to find um, the doubling time of, of the volume of data that we have, digital data in the world, and you know, it's doubling something like every two years. Okay. So right now, I think in 2009, we're sitting at about one zettabyte, 10 to the 21. So I think that's a trillion gigabytes, right? And so that means if you go two more years, you've doubled that. Okay. Let's think about you can draw a line anywhere on this graph. And say, I, I care about here, right? I'm at 400. What does it take to go up to 800 zettabytes? Well, it means that on the left side, I have the entire history of humankind. And on the right side, I have the entire history of humankind plus two years. OK, so two years. So as a vendor, I am focusing on the new stuff, right? This is all new, right? And what we know is what's in our brains and our history, which is all of the old stuff. So while we think it's crazy to move data on, into the cloud, Right? When I started the company, I said, we're going to take your database, we're going to put it on the internet, we're going to put it everywhere, right? like, like Akamai for your database. And people said, that's crazy. Right? But the reality is that solves a lot of new problems, which I want to talk about now. So these two things have broken our model of computing. If you're a developer, say with me, the LAMP stack is dead. 10 years from now, it's not going to work. Right? The, this story I just told you about data volume, it's true of connected internet devices, too. Right? We've long since passed uh, the place and time where the number of connected devices is larger than the number of humans on the globe. Right? We're way past that. So these two things conspire to break the way that we build our stack. Right? And it is all being reinvented. That's why it's such an awesome time to be a founder in this space. Name anything. 
it's all being reinvented from scratch, right? And it's being reinvented not necessarily by the big names in the field, but by people writing Ruby on Rails apps that have to solve these problems. That's where NoSQL came from in the first place. And yeah, if Fusion I.O. was cheaper in 2008, NoSQL may not have happened for a long time, right? It's just a response. So there, there are these market pressures, and the things that are coming out of this, I think, are two big examples are NoSQL and cloud services, right? So our company, Cloud Internet's database as a service. We ship with a mobile strategy. Uh, come see me if you want to know what that means. But if you look at where this falls in the realm of other cloud products, you know, our competition is Amazon. Um, we're a small company. You may have never heard of Cloudin. We're probably the smallest company with eight-digit revenues that you've never heard of in the NoSQL space. Um, but the reason is because this market is really, really good, right? And you want to be in a really good and fast-growing market. And this is the fastest-growing product that AWS has ever rolled out. So if you're interested, come join those in mobile gaming, in the enterprise, in big mobile, um, and come talk to me afterwards over beer uh, for some of these uh, arguments. Thanks. All right. Woo! Okay. Uh, thank you, Mike. So the point of this session is to give you a little warm up to the conference. To uh, I hope we've done that. We've had uh, seven excellent speakers. Eight great topics. Um, you've got some thought leadership, some new product announcements, you've got um, some very cool technology. Um, we're going to keep the bar open for another 45 minutes or so until 6.30. Uh, thank you to the folks at Clustrix for enabling us to do that. Um, and uh, I hope you enjoy the next two days after this uh, with us. Um, take advantage of the, of the partnership opportunities that have been announced tonight as well as many others. And um, just enjoy, you know, learn a lot while you're here. Hope you enjoy. Thanks.